Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Fantastic first panel. Um, what I would like to do first is just get everybody to introduce themselves. So um, if we can start off, actually, we'll start with Chris at the end. Yeah, so Chris, um, so I work for Wavemaker um, and, and I've been working kind of within digital advertising and marketing for about 15 years. Um, Marina's comment around Gen Alpha and, and how far back I now go makes me do feel quite old. Um, but yeah, um, uh, basically I look after kind of strategy, digital strategy for a number of clients over at Wavemaker. Hi, um, I'm Amy. I work at Teeds. Um, I'm on the kind of creative strategy side of the business. Um, so we work very closely with our clients to make sure we are um, optimising creative and making use of all of those great technologies to kind of deliver effective campaigns. Hi, I'm Sarah Whitfield. Um, I'm the CMO at a company called Kovatic. Um, essentially, Kovatic um, supports the media industry um, to deliver advertising and content to targeted audiences, but really importantly, privacy first. Hello, uh, my name is Azara Corrales and I'm media manager at Rock and Mill, uh, full service performance marketing, and I am specialized in like anything that is new, including the already dead metaverse. Hi everyone, my name is Jerusha. I work at OMD Mia as a strategy and planner. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, my team manages everything from the strategy, where the placement goes, where it reaches and beyond. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah, particularly for coming in with her broken foot, uh, which she is shielding quite boots. effectively in her <laughs> boots. So um, I'm going to do a quick fire round, just one sentence from everybody, uh, just to tell us, please, what is your priority to ensure uh, maximum efficiency for 2024? And I'm going to start with you, Jerusha. Sorry, say that again. What's my priority? It's what's your priority to ensure maximum efficiencies in 2024? So literally what you're going to talk about just in one sentence. To keep up with social media as much as we all want to run away from it. I feel like it's our job to know what's going on in the media sphere and to keep up to date. Thank you. Athahara? Uh, for me, it's test your algorithm, whatever it looks like, whatever it is, Pmax, Demand Gen, Facebook, anything, test your algorithm this year. Um, I think for us, it's a sort of two-speed targeting strategy. So still keeping that mass marketing um, side running smoothly, um, but also looking for those short-term performance wins. I think from my side, the um, the importance, we've already talked about this morning, the importance of some context um, and the shift beyond third-party data is going to be um, a real opportunity to kind of really focus in on the creative and how important that is and, um, you know, helping our clients deliver their outcomes across mobile, web, and CTV in those optimizations. Yeah, and then for me, I think uh, first it's to really kind of define what kind of media effectiveness actually means um, versus things like efficiency. Um, and also from a brand perspective, what, uh, what, what they need to do in terms of knowing their audience um, and, and understanding kind of actually who they're talking to and, and why um, to obviously, again, inc increase that effectiveness. Right, I'm actually going to start with you, Chris, just on that point, building on those points. Um, talking about all the conflicting uh, priorities that we are all facing at the moment in our industry. Um, new emerging platforms, there has been a phenomenal squeeze on budgets that still continues. Obviously, for consumers, there is a cost of living crisis that is ongoing. So in terms of marketing effectiveness, Chris, how are you advising brand clients to balance success for today uh, with planning for tomorrow, please? Yeah, so, so as I touched on just then, I think it's important to, to understand actually what we mean by media effectiveness. And I think we get sometimes bogged down with, with the classic kind of acronyms that we love, CTRs, VTRs, CPCs, and, and all of that sort of stuff. And actually, that's just talking about efficiency, right? That's not telling you how effective your campaign is, how effective the messaging is, how effective kind of that, that piece of work was. And I think we need to kind of look at when we, when we talk to brands and we talk to kind of those clients around their campaigns and what their goals is uh, goals are for that specific moment. We need to look at things like you know uh, brand trust, brand recall. You know, building also an organic audience for that brand to really kind of hone in on. And I think that's a really important point because, as I say, I think we we can get bogged down with 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 the old stuff and 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 stuff that's kind of it's just not necessarily relevant when you're looking at kind of marketing in this in this new age. Um, I think from a brand perspective, um, there's a number of topics that, that we talk about to, to, to clients. And I think one, 
one topic that I think shouldn't ever go away and, and it's been around for a long time is obviously ESG, so everything around climate and sustainability. Um, I think playing on that, I think we know that new generations, whether that is Z or, or Alpha, um, are, are very aware of kind of the perilous predicament within, within the planet. Um, and I think they're very aware of how their actions and how their kind of purchase abilities or, or, or kind of purchase decisions um, make, make an impact. So I think when you take that topic as uh, uh, on its own, I think it's important to, I think, advise brands to, 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 to talk with some authority on it, but also to make sure we're holding them to account as well. Um, I think we're in a, a, a fortunate position, uh, a number of us are, to, to be able to kind of help, I think, shape a brand's thinking or shape a brand's kind of uh, messaging to the marketplace and, and making sure that it's not just bullshit and it's greenwashing. It is actually meaningful and actually doing something. Um, so that's one topic I think I would I would be kind of talking to brands about um, on the whole. Um, there are many, you know, we, we love buzzwords. So obviously we've talked about AI and um, kind of DE&I as well is, is very important. But I think ESG and everything around sustainability and climate is, yeah, big topic. Yeah, it's it's everywhere across the media at the moment, 100%. Um, right, Sarah, just coming to you next. Um, so just thinking um, about the accessibility that we've got to consumers now and their potential that brands have um, to reach audiences anywhere, video, uh, OOH, CTV, smart speakers, but there are obvious concerns that consumers are just being overwhelmed by the sheer volume um, of, uh, of what they're hit with every day. So how will consumer engagement evolve, evolve this year and beyond in light of all of these recent developments that we're seeing? Yeah, okay. So uh, agreed. I think um, finding audiences as we kind of head into 2024 is going to become extremely interesting i think um the 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 sheer range of um interactions across devices and platforms is only increasing and that is really leading to much more fragmentation um and in turn that leads for complexity for brands trying to either find or reach um new audiences um i think Literally last week, um, anyone that was a, in Las Vegas at CES saw a whole raft of new gadgets and futuristic um, technology um, come out of, of that event. And I think these, um, I suppose, user-centric innovations are providing lots of opportunity for consumers to connect in interesting ways with brands and maybe engage more with brands. Um, but they're also creating lots and lots of opportunities for advertisers um, to connect in, in potentially a sort of always on way with their consumers. Um, I think that leads to a couple of things. The, the opportunity is one thing and, and that's fantastic. Um, but it also means that as consumers start to engage with these new innovations, um, marketeers are required um, to basically be able to um, figure out how they target um, at scale in a precise way without relying on identifiers. And I think that's a key thing for 2024. Um, I think um, that um, that is, is the big consideration, but it's not just coming from the advertising industry. It's also coming from the consumers themselves. So whilst they may be excited by um, all the new ways um, and new technology that's available to them, they are requiring brands to be act more responsibly um, in terms of how they're targeted, um, while still expecting the same quality. They still want amazing um, advertising content, et cetera, fed to them but they are holding us more to account. So I think as we um, move throughout this year, um, I think figuring out those ways to still be able to address those audiences, but in a privacy first way, um, is gonna be a, a key thing for us to kind of consider. Yeah, it's all about audiences. Yeah, 100%, thank you. Um, okay, we've already mentioned this today, obviously, a AR, um, you know, is very important um, because of, of uh, Ariel and who is actually sponsoring the event today. Um, so I want to put this 
forward to Amy um, because you are a specialist in this area. Um, you talk about developments in AR technology and formats for omnichannel activations. So I'd like to ask you, um, how do you see AR impacting things like the KPIs, such as uh, things like customer experience, engagements, and conversion rates moving forward, please. Yeah, definitely. I think um, thinking back to Claudia's uh, comment at the beginning, you know, AR has given us and, and those technologies have given us the ability to build ads that people love, um, and we're really, really seeing that in kind of some of the uh, some of the activations that we've been working on at Teed. So um, we have a great job at Teed to be able, and some of my team are here today to actually be able to kind of work closely with our clients, collaborating, making use of great platforms from such as Ariel um, to be able to build really exciting interactive experiences. So whether that's taking kind of 3D models of, um, of uh, luxury bags, um, whether that's allowing um, where we've actually moved from, we've moved beyond just being able to kind of look at 3D models of products in the space, but actually then be able to try things on. So um, we, had, um, we had campaigns, we worked very closely with um, Adidas, I'm sure they won't mind me dropping their name in here. Um, so they do, they do virtual try-ons now with us. So we're able to kind of build this great AR experience, which allows the user to kind of activate it via the in-read. Um, and um, before we know it, we're able to try on a pair of trainers in their own space. So that level of engagement is increasing massively. Um, and that's been facilitated by the uh, advancements in technologies in this area. So um, beyond kind of um, AR and virtual try-on space, we're also moving more into kind of VR. I know Rob's mentioned that already. And um, we had a really exciting um activation with an auto brand last year where uh, we built an, a VR portal for them so um, it allowed the user to kind of immerse themselves in in their kind of um, the virtual world and uh, look at different pieces of content and um, view the car from different angles find out more information um, we've seen some really exciting dwell times on these activations but what's really interesting is now we're we're, we're in the omnichannel space at Teeds and we are extending these AR um, executions um, across CTV and how we're doing that is we're obviously CTV gives us a huge opportunity to kind of you know do that big brand building piece so heroing the video and the content on the TV um, but we've uh, we're very very excited about the kind of um, resurgence of the QR code because the QR code allows us to do um, a lot of exciting activations and really bridge that kind of um, uh, into that offline uh, online space so um, this portal uh, has this that so we did the kind of CTV ad um, uh, had a QR code and the user was able to scan the QR code um, obviously they're in that lean back experience in in their living room um, and the dwell time and the engagement rates that we saw when it, the the VR was activated from the CTV on the QR code were huge we were seeing kind of on average like sort of 50 plus seconds dwell time which is pretty it's pretty exciting um, so there's something really nice about being able to kind of you know have that um, have that unique experience activated across omnichannel so we're really excited about what's uh, what's coming in that space fantastic thank you um, Athahara I want to just have a chat with you about a report that came out from PMG. We talked about this uh, when, we, when we had a chat earlier about the power of integrated media and commerce. And of course, commerce being a huge trend for 2024. Um, we all know that retail giants uh, hold enormous, valuable audience insights. So my question to you would be, will retail media and digital advertising become further interconnected? I mean, I can't see how it won't be, but it would be great to hear your views yeah. on that, please. Um, it is not only that they are going to be further integrated, but uh, it's a reality now. So the best example of this is the uh, partnership that Meta and Amazon announced uh, last year in the United <laughs> States which basically works in a way that Amazon integrate their store um, to Meta, so the user can directly, when they see an ad, click in the product and go directly to the product page and buy it, which is huge, like it's changing the way that we are going to understand e-commerce in the future. Uh, why are they doing this? Well, first, for Meta, is great because they guarantee certain revenue from advertising from Amazon, which is fantastic. And it's great because they can finally track conversions, which, you know, is quite new for us, finally. Um, and then it's good for Amazon because uh, they will have access to first party data, which especially after this year is going to be more than relevant. 
Um, and also is exploring a new platform from there from, for them so they can you know, get revenue through social media, a trend that we have seen in the last couple of years where we've seen more users moving from the shopping experience in the website, going straight to social media and buying, especially TikTok, for example. Um, and what is the benefit for the user? Well, the benefit for the user is that it's a much more straightforward um, a purchase um, experience where they just see the product that they want. Here, the creative is going to be really important. You need to make people want that product. It won't be just like the normal Amazon ad that we used to see. Um, and then just with a click, they will be able to buy this. So that's really cool. The problem with that is um, it's just um, a deal that big brands uh, like Amazon is doing. Well, if you're not Amazon, what do you do? That's the question. Um, this is going to happen. This is the future. So I can see Meta and Pinterest, for example, is another deal that Amazon has signed. Uh, they will open it up for everyone in the future. But until that moment, what can you do? The answer is catalogs. Uh, maybe it's not as a straightforward experience buying, having a catalog, um, but it's the best solution you can have. Um, work in your catalog, make sure that uh, your websites and your landing pages and the product pages are good so that experience is as smooth as possible for the user. And if your audience is Gen Z, make sure that you are in TikTok because that's the alternative. While big brands are signing with Meta, then we have TikTok revolutionary uh, e-commerce through this sort of marketplace that they are creating in TikTok and that it gives the opportunity to every single brand to be on it only if you have a catalog. So yeah, make sure that you work in your catalog. But yeah, it's very, very exciting. I'm actually like looking forward to see because I don't think that it's only for shopping experiences, it's for any service. I, at the end of the day, like you can create, I have done it with some of my clients where even if it's not um, a product, if it's a service, for example, you can still create a catalog and run an ad and run dynamic ads, for example. So, if that's the future and then at the end Meta will open this opportunity to every single brand, if you are selling, for example, I don't know, I'm thinking in like a university and you have different degrees, if you um, do your advertising and someone in social media see an ad, maybe they can sign up into a degree just directly through it. So yeah, very, very exciting times, yeah. Yeah, yeah lots, of, lots of innovation. And actually just staying on that topic of retail, Chris, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, the question is, what, uh, how, does, how will brand loyalty be impacted uh, by this intersection of media and retail moving forward? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think I'd, I'd take it a step back, actually, and ask how important brand loyalty is nowadays. Um, from a perspective of, I think it's limited, right? I think there's a, there's a small amount of por portion of people who can truly be brand loyal to certain brands. I think that is, tends to be the preserve of the more higher-end products. Um, whether that you're talking cars or whether you're talking bags or clothes or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at actually what a brand needs to do within maybe brand loyalty space, I think it's actually about becoming a trusted brand. I think it's a brand that you recognize. If you take an example, uh, and you might be able to guess what account I've been working on, but if you take the example of toothpaste as an example, are you ever really going to be brand loyal to a certain brand of toothpaste, generally speaking, you're probably going to be either buying on cost, its availability, or whether you actually recognize the brand. So I think from that perspective, I think it goes back to the, to the, to the earlier question about effectiveness. I think it involves kind of building that brand, building that, that awareness and that brand recall. Um, and I think that's more important. Um, and then also around that kind of topic of, and you, you take toothpaste as an example, being able to, to lower the barrier of entry to purchase it, you know, it, it doesn't always necessarily need to be a bricks and mortar shop. To do that online um, or to do it through, through, through social, I know you can do obviously the, 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 the purchasing of products through obviously whether it's Instagram or, or TikTok or wherever. So I think that's more important personally than I think concentrating on that brand loyalty piece. Um, I want to say that I agree with you. I think like the future is more than 
you know, I'm loyal to this brand because they are good. It's going to be a lot about the experience. Like if you buy from or you try to buy from a, from a brand and then you go into a landing page that is not working, for example, then you'll be like, no. But if you constantly have a positive experience, buying a product from someone is reliable, is quick, your delivery is great, then you are going to be loyal to that brand more than anything else. Like, I think it will be huge, your experience through anything, social media, website, whatever it is. And that will be really important in how loyal you are to the brand. Yeah, I think um, adding to what you were saying earlier that, you know, the things that are showing up now are that um, engagement, speed, cost. But the other one that's kicking in now is entertainment value. And I think what you were saying earlier around brands like TikTok and what they're doing, that is also becoming really, really quite fundamental. Thank you. Um, going to come to you, uh, Jerusha, uh, talking about complexity um, yeah. within the industry. Um, so it's huge consideration in terms of obviously brand safety. It's no longer considered a tick box exercise when planning media campaigns. So how can brands be confident they're balancing the protective measures that are needed without restricting the reach and impact they need. Okay, before I go off, let me just say I'm guilty for the TikTok shopping. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I do it a lot, it's a bit of a problem. Um, <laughs> on brand safety, so I work for Apple, as you may know, they're probably one of those companies that are so serious about where the brand turns up, who we're around, etc. So my first point would be around news. So a little bit of backstory, when I was a student, I thought, let me make some extra money, but you know, I wanna do it for my bed. So I thought, let me start trading. I started learning about the trading sphere, the financial sphere, and what I've noticed is the financial market and the marketing market are quite similar, where you will learn a lot about the world in general, people, etc. When I was making trades, I realized, okay, I've got my budget, I've got money on the side. I've also, in, when in strategy, we've got a budget, we've got money, we've got goals. It's the same in trading. One thing I've noticed with trades is if, for instance, a certain company isn't doing well or a certain commodity isn't doing well, you wouldn't make that trade or you make a trade based on what the news is stating. And wh when I was saying earlier, be on social media, it goes kind of beyond that. And you have to make a real focus on, okay, if I'm, creating an advert and I'm going to be deciding where it should go, what is the current climate of the world? What are they saying? Platforms such as X, news publications. Is it really the time to be pushing a certain advert, a certain campaign, a certain creative? Is it the time to be around sadness? Because when you think about marketing, advertising and media, it's quite psychological. So when people keep seeing a certain ad placement around certain themes or certain um, websites that don't really portray anything positive or doesn't align with your brand, you start to find that people start to put your brand alongside what they're seeing and making the conscious decision to say this is actually quite negative and they might not outrightly say that it is or anything like that but you'll start seeing patterns in their behavior so I feel like we should really start treating the marketing sphere like the financial sphere and understand where the conversations are happening what are they about to really protect what we're doing so that's my first point. My second point would be on messaging and the creative. A lot of the first panel spoke about that and communities. And I agree when you're looking at social media. So I'm the customer. I'm, I'm a millennial, but I'm also um, Gen Z. And I've noticed with us and social media, it's kind of like our safe haven. It's a home away from home. It's where you see your friends a lot of the time. And they are massive communities. And when we think about community, we have to understand that these communities have ethos, they have beliefs, they have certain ways of working. And when we're portraying a certain message, we need to understand, okay, are we making assumptions based on who we think will be targeted? Because nine times out of 10, yes, we target the right people and we always make sure, but it's not perfect. Everything isn't, you know, 100% foolproof. So you might land into a person's lap that has, you know, not the same pronouns as your adverts might have, or you might be um, advertising to somebody who's not religious at all. And maybe your ad has a sort of undertone of religion in it. So I really do believe that what you're saying and how you're saying is really important and to just focus on the product itself more so than trying to have, you know, like it's meme culture going on, like we were saying earlier, like a catchy phrase or a catchy term. We might not understand it or we might assume and we're not a generation where 
we assume things about each other or we judge things about each other or we really care about each other's feelings. So the last thing we want to do is have a message that goes against all of that and offend the whole generation, especially Alpha, where they're potentially going to be in real life. Um, and I think that's quite interesting learning about what we've gone through. So, yeah, my whole point is think about your message. Think about how you're saying it. Sometimes it's okay to be more so simple than expressive or to match the times and to really understand what's going on in the news sphere. And my third point would be on tools. So there's so many tools out there. I know it's not like it's not like tick boxing anymore because I'm in strategy and I realize there's so much that goes around just putting an ad placement there. However, I understand there's more options towards ensuring that your brand is protected, like keyword, negative keywords, um, certain words that you want to stay away from, or even taking the time. I know it will take a lot of time sometimes, but taking the time in a team to actually be like, is this platform okay? Is this partner okay? What what what's the theme on this kind of page and then having that list going forward to say you know what these are the kind of people we're not going to work with because of this x y and z the news the kind of message that's on there and really utilizing the tools that are in place to ensure that your ad is protected and also your brand perfect thank you so much jerusha that's great do we have um amira do we have time for any questions Mira's in charge of the timekeeping. Yes. Oh, uh, fantastico. I'm the lady in the dark. She is the lady <laughs> that takes the questions. Are you, do you want to read? Yeah, absolutely. Panel? So the first question is, how is CTB planned to be leveraged with the deprivation of cookies and IDs in 2024? When considering brand awareness and cost of living crisis, what is the media effectiveness plan to ensure you're still reaching the targeted audience? Anybody want to take that one? Yeah. Um, so, so one of the conversations actually that we're having um, with a client at the moment is around how they're kind of building that organic audience. And so I, I think a lot of, although it's not crept up on us, the, the deprecation, um, to a lot of brands it kind of has. Um, and I think planning for it has maybe taken a bit of a back step. So I think one of the the key things that they're thinking about is how they can broaden kind of their organic audience, how they can own the conversation more and how they can then remarket to that audience. Um, things like working out what a long-term value of that customer would be or the lead. Um, and a lot of kind of uh, metrics around that is something that we need to become better at. But I think for, for a number of brands, yeah, definitely the organic audience that they can own and, and speak to is, is, is a big part of how to, to kind of navigate the... The, the murky waters of third-party cookies. I'll add to that, um, and that's the reason why I mentioned it at the beginning when, like, well, what I will do in 2024 is artificial intelligence. Uh, when we're not going to have access to data anymore, then you have a really advanced machine that knows more than you and is going to understand who your audience is better than you. So test it, make sure that it knows who is showing your ad to. And it can do also, it's quite cheap, like things like PMAX and demand gen, for example. Don't do demand gen, it's not working right now. <laughs> um, but PMAX, for example, um, it is a really, it's much more cheaper than a uh, conventional search uh, campaign, for example. And if you test it and it gets to learn who your target audience is, it can become really efficient. So that's the reason why in 2024, and that will be very helpful also for brand awareness because it tends to be very good for reach and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think AI, I think one of the ways that it will kick in for the marketing industry is in that data side of things. And I think that could be quite well, it will be transformative and I think it will level the playing fields a lot between bigger and, and smaller brands. I think just to add to um, what we were saying, Chris was saying earlier, um, I think what we heard on the ground um, last week at CES was that a lot of the, the brands and platforms are going to be sort of trialing um, new, um, new um, ways of, of measuring and, and targeting audiences. What they're not probably gonna do is throw out what they're doing currently, but they're probably gonna be combining um, different kind of solutions. And so I think as we move into 2024, there'll be a lot more sort of trial and learn. And I think that sort of being agile and that test and learn mi mindset is gonna be really, really key. So I don't think it's gonna be um, a case of, 
you're ready or you're not ready. I think it will be, there's been a lot of investment from a lot of companies in first party data, for example. Mm -hmm. They're going to start to combine that with other technologies like on device. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's what we'll see. Great. Fantastic. We couldn't obviously have a panel without talking about cookies. So I think it's been on the topic of every panel I've been on for the last three years. Thank you.